We're going to call the meeting to order, please. Liz, do you want to do the honors? Do you want to do the honors, Ms. Parsons, <laughs> as our vice president? Welcome, everybody. <laughs> okay. okay, that works. All right. That works. We just had an interesting meal, and I just wanted to tell you that our speaker, Arthur Dawson, and his wife, Jill, have a family member rock climbing in Yosemite at this very moment. And um, so she's going to be checking in. <laughs> but at El Capitan, which is no mean thing. Anyway, welcome. We're delighted to have you here, and we're looking forward to hearing Arthur's talk. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Arthur Dawson. He's a historical ecologist who's been in the county how many years now? Uh, he's yeah. famous. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, when you say it that way, it always seems bigger for some reason. Like I'm more than half a century old, and I go, oh. That sounds funny. But anyway, he's done enormous amounts of research. He's a poet, a writer. Um, how many books have you published on Sonoma County history and poetry? Okay, and the most recent one. <laughs> Ta-da! Uh, just moved into the, being the chair of Sonoma Mountain Preservation. Uh, four, uh, four years ago, we published this book, which I had the honor of being the primary Photographers and everybody, various photographers and um, but it really did not write. And um, yeah, it was a book and it was a local bestseller. And, it's, and it won a uh, third prize in the international income. All right. Yeah. Will we be able to buy copies tonight? Absolutely. Oh, good. <laughs> and everybody goes to some Arthur just completed an interesting study, and that's what he wanted to talk about tonight. Going but um, the participants. I just keep I also because I want to make find sure that his background list in history and that'll just pop up. It, now you prefer to be called a historical ecologist or an ecological historian. <laughs> so, so, okay, and it is a fascinating yeah, field. Yeah, everybody You've seen really goes in for a week. Democrat over the years. Uh, so he's a product of humble state. You see, that is my and, uh, Your major up there yes. was natural resources management. So I will, rather than babble on, except for announcements, we do have to have announcements. Anybody have an announcement of importance? Betty, did you <laughs> want to say anything about the plant sale? Uh, other than to thank everybody that did it. We had a great pretty sale nice. Saturday, thanks to Lynette and Natasha um, <laughs> and all our volunteers, both in the nursery and at the sale. And meanwhile, we participated in the eco-friendly garden tour. CNPS sponsored two gardens in um, Oakmont and Katati. Thank you, Liz, <laughs> for volunteering at Oakmont. And uh, we had between the three gardens, we had over 900 people visit those gardens. 538 of those were at Laguna Foundation. Woohoo! About 200 at each of our other gardens. So people are finally getting the message. Yes. I think. So it was inspiring. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for always using it. Work. And plant sale. It's an enormous amount of work. And uh, it certainly could be lauded for it. Arthur, it's your turn. Have you got a lapel mic? Oops. Oh, announcement. Sorry. Quick announcement. I think this is my teacher voice here. Double Potted Conservation Council is going to be a collaborative group that my little thing is here. And we just closed the environmental center. But we're still doing events. We have three social events a year. For people who are working on environmental causes in the county, they actually get together and visit. Um, and what is this Sunday? Three social in Forestville. It's free. If anybody's interested, um, we haven't changed the URL to the environmental center website yet. 
So it's Enviro Center, SoCo.org, and the information is there, or you can have to do free social events for people to talk to each other about whatever. There's an environmental We can find time and location for you. Or the website. Or the website. All right. Anybody else? Right. Mike right. here. And, See you. Uh, and I have, have my position for the camera. Yeah, we're here. I think you're good. Can I go? How far can I go? Oh, about the width of the table. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Virginia. And, and thank you to the Native Plant Society for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm excited to share a project that uh, took about three years to complete. And um, this, we just put this out uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, it's still being reviewed by Cal Fire, but um, Biggest, most complicated project you've ever done. It's like I just got out of grad school. I don't think anybody's better done my name yet, but um, so I got to work with um, Pepperwood as a partner, and also uh, Mark Chuckman, if you know the Stone of Edge Map, he was one of the main uh, movers with that, and also uh, Dr. Jim Thorne from UC Davis. Um, so we had a good group to do this with, and. And then, of course, thank you to Cal Fire for seeing uh, the value of this project because it, it was a little like, outside of what they, they normally would have funded. Uh, the historical is still a little bit of a, a fringe uh, field, I would say, but gaining popularity. Let's see. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I Probably easiest just to use the cursor, the left right button. Uh, oh. Try the space bar. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh. <laughs> we got her. Yeah. Jack, go, Jack, go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so good. Okay. Okay. Two more on the wait list again. Okay. Great. Nice. That's okay. the thing is every 30 so, seconds um, or so. So, just, so the, the yeah. study was um, <clears throat> covered four areas. I'll show you a map in just a moment. Um, so it spread throughout the North Bay, um, a, a large area, you know, a couple hundred square miles close to it. Um, we wanted to get a, a good um, coverage of the landscape. And two reasons that we chose each of these areas was one was the Cal Fire had identified certain areas as high risk for various reasons, high risk for fire. And then also to do this kind of a study um, over such a long period of time. Um, it had to be places where you could get uh, data going back uh, 150 years. So vegetation data as well as fire data. So those two things sort of limited us to the places that we chose. Uh, but I mean, you could do other, other areas, but these are the ones that we chose. So you can see, um, is there a pointer? Uh, that's okay. So you can see, I'm mostly um, going to talk about uh, the Sonoma Napa study area and the Sonoma West study area since we're in Sonoma County. Uh, I'll, I'll mention the other two occasionally, but mostly I'll be talking about those ones. And you know, these, these areas are, um, you know, I wouldn't say they're, they're not quite untouched by people, but they have a fairly small human footprint. Uh, some of them have had some timber harvest. Um, Sonoma Napa actually has only had um, it's one of the smallest footprints, and um, so in some ways, these are almost natural experiments. Um, you know, maybe some fire suppression, but not not a lot of uh, human interference in what the vegetation has been in, in many places. So the sources, um, you know, there's a number of different sources. I'll be sharing some of these with you. So going all the way back to early narratives, you know, descriptions of the landscape. Um, there's early surveys that were done. If you've seen the, the uh, township and range lines on topo maps, um, those were all surveyed on foot, on the ground, uh, mostly in the late 19th century. And the surveyors were required to record uh, vegetation in the order of abundance as they walked these lines. So they, they serve as kind of crude vegetation transects. Um, so I've learned how to interpret those, and there's uh, like the vegetation tank maps that those were done over a large part of the state by uh, Dr. Wieslander, who is a um, uh, UC Berkeley, and also other, other folks who were involved in that, but they mapped quite a big part of the state. And then soil veg maps done by the Soil Service, and then more recently, um, the wildlife. So good. No. It, it went off. 
So then there's the uh, uh, fish and wildlife, the, the uh, wildlife habitat relationship maps. And then more recently, um, we had a Sonoma Veg map done by the county and a number of uh, other agencies and organizations. And then over in Napa, they had a similar map done in 2016. So it's a whole, um, it's a whole long history of vegetation mapping. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit how, how you go about bringing these things into alignment. And then um, the fire history depends on the CAL FIRE perimeters, which go back about 70 years, 80 years at this point. And then before that, you have to go back to early narrative accounts and use the information there to, to draw uh, perimeters, which, which can be done. Um, I've worked out some techniques for that. But kind of going through the middle of all of this, kind of the, the continuous record really is, um, some people call it traditional ecological knowledge. I mean, that's a, that's a fine term, but I find it it feels a little bit, um, sounds a little academic to me. I like indigenous wisdom uh, better. I think it captures a little more of, um, of what the knowledge really is about uh, because it doesn't really just stop within the ecological uh, field. It goes beyond into human relationships. And um, so I, I prefer indigenous wisdom. And I also included a little bit of uh, local knowledge, which is, doesn't go as deep as the indigenous knowledge, but um, you know, I've talked to people whose families got here, you know, 150 years ago. So I've got some um, some local knowledge just from that, which is similar to indigenous knowledge, but just not quite as deep. Uh, <laughs> Technology, isn't it great? <laughs> I can talk pretty loud too. Yeah, does that, that work? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I'm not going to read through these, but this, these are just sort of to introduce you to some of the ideas that I'll be covering, and I'll come back to this at the end. But I think the biggest thing that surprised me during this project was just how dynamic these vegetation patterns are. Um, you know, that, that things can go through massive changes just in a few decades. Um, things that I might have thought were much more permanent really are, are fairly uh, temporary. Um, and let's see. So first I just want to talk about indigenous wisdom because you know it's really um, the framework that I put the rest of this information into. Um, you know this this knowledge goes back um, you know really to the beginnings of human time. Um, you know, probably 10,000 years ago or more. So this is knowledge that's been accumulated over many, many years. And I talked to several indigenous elders, uh, not as many as I would have liked to, but I, I did uh, have some really good conversations with, with several people. And one of the things that um, struck me is that it's, that they talk about it's all about relationships, relationships of people to, you know, the landscape, to fire, to vegetation. And so I think that's, that's just a good sort of starting point is to think about this is all about relationships and fire, vegetation, and people all have kind of this, this triangle relationship. So the person I got to talk to in most depth was Clint McKay, who some of you have probably uh, heard of, or if you're lucky if you've heard him speak. Um, and he's on the advisory council of Peverwood. Um, his roots go back in the county, um, you know, the time in memorial. And when I spoke with him, one of the first thing I asked him was like, so what's, what is your earliest memory of cultural burning? And he said, well, you know, probably the first time I ever saw it was when I was still in a baby basket. I really can't remember. Um, so it's really, but my people have been doing this, you know, as, as far back as, you know, all the way back. But he really kind of took himself out of the equation and, you know, put this more in a context of his culture, uh, which I thought was an interesting um, it's an interesting adjustment for me to make to take it from a personal into more of a cultural context. Um, so one of the things that he said, this is here's Clint right here. 
And this is him with his family uh, doing a cultural burn at Pepperwood. And one of the things that he mentioned was you know, thinking about the difference between cultural burning and prescriptive or controlled burning. And it's really about you know, who is it supposed to benefit? Is the benefit supposed to mostly go to people or does it include pretty much everything in the environment? And that was a, a distinction that he wanted to be very clearly made. And someone else I talked to was uh, Sarah Moncada, who's uh, the director out at Heron Shadow, which is out uh, near Drayton. And Heron Shadow is, a, they call themselves a biocultural oasis. Um, so it's, it's owned by the Cultural Conservancy, which is run to the benefit of all indigenous people in the, I think, North America, or maybe even in all the Americas. And so this is one thing that she said was, you know, we consider Fire to be a member of the community one who is far wiser and more powerful than we are. And I thought, you know, what a contrast with smoking the bear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here it's really bringing fire into the circle of the human circle. And it struck me just today, actually, as I put this together, that here's, here's Clint, there's his family, you know, they're, they're kind of making a, a circle of community, and he's lighting the fire within that circle. You know, it's, it's not a wildfire, it's a, it's a cultural burn. <laughs> And just that whole concept that you know fire is something wild that we have to control. Um, you know, that's there are, there are other ways to think about it. So these are some some insights that I got from speaking with indigenous folks. And again, I'm not going to read through all these, but um, you know, and I, I'm not I don't want to pretend like I'm speaking for the indigenous elders that I talked to, but these are some things that that sort of sparked in me some ideas. Um, you know, and, and I'll show you some examples of this, but you know, plants have their own agenda, you know, outside of the human agenda. They're, they're doing their own thing. And he, I'll show you how uh, Douglas Fir really demonstrates this. Um, you know, it's, it's important to be humble because, you know, we're just limited beings. We're not, you know, we don't really have control over everything. You know, we may like to think we do, but in reality, we, we don't have control. Uh, the best we can hope for is to think about what, what is our role in the landscape? What's the proper role for people? Um, and, um, and then just one more to mention here, this long-term thinking creates generational wealth. Um, Clint talked about um, how his people managed or tended black oaks on a 200 or 300 year cycle. So they would always have you know, acorns as their favorite uh, acorn tree. And you have to imagine like, like tending a tree and knowing that your great great grandchildren are gonna benefit from that that you'll probably never meet. Um, it just made me think that's, that really is a form of generational wealth that was being created. And I think um, in a sense what we're seeing right now with the, all the devastation of the fires, it's almost like generational poverty or generational disaster that's, that's happening. So a whole different way of, of thinking about things. And then this is the third person I talked to. Um, this is uh, Redbird Willie, who's also had a hair and shadow. And when I showed him the maps from this project, he said, you yeah, know, well, that's how the land looks when it's not being tended properly. Which, you know, I didn't take it personally, but it kind of set me back like, wow, I've done all this work, you know, put in a couple of years on this project, and really all I'm doing is just kind of documenting how poorly the land has been treated over the last 150 years. And, you know, I thought about it, and I, and I think he's right. I think at some level, that's this is very true. Um, and what I'm going to show you is really, the results of a lot of just poor stewardship, to put it that way. Um, so one example, um, like he talked a lot about how you know things were more open in the old days, and so this is a um, this is from an old survey description. This is on a survey line um, up on the side of a uh, big mountain, and it's described 150 years ago as covered with chamizal or chemise, and now it's completely open. I'm not sure actually now it might have burned, but and at the time this picture was taken, uh, it was all heavily forested uh, with maybe some dead chemise on the ground uh, underneath dying oak trees, underneath healthy looking <laughs> Douglas firs. So we're going we're to pull out of the indigenous um, wisdom and go into the historical record. And this is, this is one of the bridges. Uh, this is the oldest description of uh, cultural burning and, and Forest in Sonoma County that I know of. This is the guy who founded the Sonoma Mission. 
um, or he colonized the area, if you want to put it that way. And um, and interesting that he, he's noticing the cultural burning going on, although he doesn't really think of it that way. And then he also is describing what the effect was of that cultural burning, which was to keep the place, you know, pretty open and you know, not not so brushy as we have it today. So these are some of the questions that um, the study looked at, you know, looking at, at patterns of fire and vegetation. Um, you know, there, how can we explain some of these fire patterns? Um, what are the things that might have a bearing on that? Um, you know, what are the relationships between fire, vegetation, and people, and how have those changed over time? Um, and then if we have a chance, I'll see how the time goes. If we have a chance, I'll, I'll get into uh, there might be a tipping point um, for catastrophic fire that we can identify in the vegetation patterns. And then of course the whole the whole purpose of this is to see if we can you know live if we can tend the land, land better and um, you know, improve ecological health and also make it a, a place that you know we can be safer in the long run. <laughs> so vegetation data. Um, one of the things I mentioned how there's you know, this long stretch of vegetation data you know, it's collected by different people at different times, you know, it, it, in some ways it seems like it's this big sort of mishmash. But um, one piece of advice I got early on was to, to take everything and kind of filter it into the three main categories in the manual is the California vegetation. So you've got you know, grasslands or herbaceous, you've got shrublands, and you've got forest or woodlands. And as it turns out, you can take all the data that I use going back 150 years and it, and it all filters through into these categories uh, pretty, I wouldn't say easily necessarily, but it's, you can do it. Um, and then there's a couple others that come up as you look at the data. There's also you know, human categories like roads and fields, things like that. And then sometimes there's water and bare rock, which don't qualify as vegetation. But, um, but even those early surveyors in the 1860s and 1870s, survey manuals told them to record the vegetation in the order of abundance, which is the same way the, um, the Wieselander maps were made, the same way the soil vegetation maps were made, the same way that the manual of California vegetation is you know, still classifying these vegetation um, patterns. So, you know, in some ways, this is kind of a plant taxonomy dumbed down to uh, the very most basic level. You, know, you got the short stuff, <laughs> you got the medium sized stuff, and you got the tall stuff. <laughs> So uh, I'll show you this. Um, so this is the uh, Sonoma Napa study area. Um, you can't quite see it, but Glen Ellen is a little bit off here to the west. Um, Oak Hill is up there to the northeast. And these are the early survey lines. So like on this one right here, these, and this uh, uh, legend will hold true throughout all the slides I'm gonna show you. So grasslands yellow, uh, shrub is orange, woodland can either be blue for hardwood or green for conifer, and then the human footprint is red, and then there's not a whole lot of other, but that, that'll be gray. So in this case, like, surveyor walked this line, and at the end of it, they wrote down something to the effect of, like, mostly only chaparral. Like, pretty clearly, that's, that's what it was. You know, it might have been a tree here and there, but pretty much that was only chaparral. Uh, blue, they would have been describing hardwoods. Um, you know, if they walked through somebody's field, that was a that was a red, these little red bits. Um, are, 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 what kind of legend? What kind of area is that represented? Um, this is about uh, close to fifty square miles. So each, yeah, as far as scale, uh, each one of these is a, a square mile, like you would see on Topo Map. So okay, so that's eighteen seventy two. Let's go ahead. 60 years, <clears throat> and this is what we get in 60 years. And one thing that surprised me in that first map was to see all this chaparral over here. This is the, uh, the east side of the ridge, so it's, it's cooler and moister than the west side of the ridge. And yet in 1872, there's all that chaparral over there, which um, seems a little surprising. Um, but if you go ahead 60 years, there's still quite a bit of chaparral in that area. And of course, here there's there's tons and tons of chaparral, um, and I'll show you partly why that is in a few minutes. And then as you go forward another 60 years, you get the, the woodlands moving into the chaparral, and the chaparral 
declining and then come just 10 years ago or less, uh, you know, it's, it's turning into mostly forest. Of course, a large portion of this burned in 2017. So um, this is not the most recent map, but, and this is just another way to look at it. You can see the, um, the pie graphs and you can just kind of see like what happens is the chaparral sort of closes up almost like a clock and the, the woodland expands. So uh, the other place I'm going to focus on is, is over in called Sonoma West. Um, this is Guerneville we'll go back here. So this is kind of northeast of Guerneville. If you happen to know the area, so the Russian River is right here. Uh, Mount Jackson is up there in this, this uh, chaparral area. Um, and this 1867 really is before there had been significant logging in this area. There had been some, but there the trains hadn't arrived yet. Uh, you know, they hadn't done a whole lot of logging. So you can see where the, the redwood forest is pretty much where uh, all the green is here, and there's some hardwoods. And surprisingly, there was chaparral within about a mile, mile and a half of where the redwoods were, just up in the hills, not that far. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, you got you almost 100 years for the next vegetation map. So in between this time, the trains came in, extensive logging happened between about 1875 and 1915. Um, and then of course there's, you know, uh, vacationers started coming, you know, building all kinds of resorts. And so the last logging was, last extensive logging was about 1915. So by the time you get here, you're at least 50 years post logging. And notice how that whole area that had been logged has now turned into hardwoods. And then, uh, then you go ahead another, uh, 28 years and, and the hardwoods are starting to fill into the conifers and then another 20 years even more conifers and the uh, the chaparral in the upper part of there is mostly disappearing just like it did uh, over in the, okay. the first place I showed you. Can I ask a question? Uh -huh. There used to be a lot of sheep ranches around that sort of thing. Would that uh, On the far right is that Santa Rosa or is that following the river or how far over uh, on the so east this side is, how far um, does that go? Yeah, this doesn't go into the San Jose Valley. So Guerneville is right here. Okay. Um, can't read this anymore, but there's, so this is about uh, five miles oh. east of Guerneville. Oh, so it's not. And there's a, a record of a cultural burning um, in this area in about 1850, 1852. So this is you know, very shortly after indigenous management had, had stopped, or it may have even still been going on in some places at that point. Well, I was just thinking a lot of sheep ranches disappeared in the 60s. So. Um, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I didn't see a whole lot of evidence for sheep ranching in this particular in spot. Area. There was, I mean, I know there was a lot of sheep out in the West County and even, even on Sonoma Mountain in the 1880s, there was a lot of sheep. So um, I'm sure in some areas those did have an effect. So then the fire data um, relies on the Cal Fire maps. And then, as I mentioned, um, looking at old newspapers, and finding, um, you, know, you can find ranch names a lot of times, or it might say you know, the bridge on Mark West Road burn. You can find all these points. And then often they would also give a size, like, you know, 3,000 acres burned and you know, so-and-so lost the ranch, they almost got this ranch. And, and so you can draw a perimeter around it. And then, um, I, so that's the way you kind of um, give each one of these perimeters a confidence level. So. You know, it's not perfect, but it but it gives you some sense of how accurate uh, these these fire perimeters are. So so taking all that all that data and putting it into uh, into this map. So this shows so the darker the blue, the more fires have happened in that those locations. And you can see even on this relatively small landscape, and we're we're back to the area that's just east of uh, Glen Ellen. Um, so some places here have burned seven times in the last 150 years. Um, I, I don't recommend buying a house on Cape Hill Road. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, Glen Oaks and Boomerang Preserve are right up, up in here, I think. So um, so you probably know parts of this area pretty well. Um, so I'll explain more about the frequent burn zone in a little bit. And then there's also a rare burn zone where there's no record of fire. Um, not, you know, just two, three miles away from the frequent bird zone, there's a place that have no record of fire at all. 
And then this is back over by Gurnville. And again, there's an area uh, that's demarked as the frequent burn zone. Uh, it hasn't burned quite as often as the area near, near Glen Allen, but still three to five fires uh, in the last 120 years. And the way I drew these, these lines, it was partly because they were places that had burned a lot, but also um, I chose places that you could say, okay, this whole place burned on a specific date, specific year. So then you can track the vegetation changes forward. So in this case, I chose, there's a fire that burned this area in 1959. So then you can track the vegetation changes forward and see what happens in, these, in the frequent burn zone as you go forward. So then bring them together. And this is that same area. So here we have a map just six years after the 1959 fire. There's a lot of chaparral at that point in time. Uh, come ahead another 30 years. And that, oops, so 47% shrub is now down to only 17% shrub just from the passage of time. Well, then with forest, and then you go ahead another 20 years, and the shrub is down to 7%. So just a very small portion um, of shrub has survived you know, that, those 54 years. That's filling in with trees. And this, this is the dynamic nature that I was talking about. Um, and you can see over on the right, there's a graph that just shows um, you know, the, the conifers are a little slow to get started after a fire, but then they take off and they eventually outcompete the hardwoods. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And then here's the one over by Glen Ellen. Uh, it's the same thing, nine years after a fire. Uh, it's mostly 73% shrub. And then you go ahead, do 29 years post fire, and you're down to 27% shrub. And then 20 years later, 49 years post fire, you're only 13% shrub. So the, the woodland again is really you know, taken over. Uh, it's 80% woodland. And this is, um, if you folks, some of you may know of a Secret Pasture. It's a land trust property that's right there. So it's just outside the frequent burn zone, but it's still burned uh, several times in the last 150 years. And I was lucky enough to be up there in 2014. And um, you know, one of the things I asked, um, I asked Clint was, so how often did you burn the chaparral? And he didn't. He wouldn't say. I said, "Well, I, you know, I just kind of watch it, and then when it feels like it's time to burn, I burn it." <laughs> um, yeah, so they don't go by the calendar. They kind of refuse to, to give me you know, years and dates and stuff. Um, but being up here at Secret Pasture, you know, 50 years after the last fire, I could just feel that this landscape wanted to burn. I mean, it was it was so ready to burn. I mean, this is, I'm sure they never let it go 50 years in the old days. Um, or another way to think of it, this is three years before the fire. <laughs> so, like, check out, okay, this is chemise right here. This is really this overgrown chemise. Uh, you got Douglas firs that are coming up you know, through the chaparral, just like you saw on the maps. Chaparral is turning into woodland. Um, that's bay right there. I never thought of bay as being a chaparral plant, but <laughs> it can start out in the chaparral and then become the forest. Um, that's probably manzanita right there. But, um, and then if you know about knob cone pine, you know, they, they hold the, the cone very tightly with their resin and it has to heat up to, I forget how much, but something like 600, 800 degrees for the cone to open up. And then the seeds are scattered onto ground that's been burned. So there's very little competition. And so they're, they're well adapted to this. Uh, in fact, they, knob cone pine really needs to burn. It doesn't, they don't live more than 60 or 80 years usually. So they need fire to regenerate. So you know, here's here's the um, approximate burn history for that area, um, and it's it's pretty regular. You know, at least um, from 1880 forward, you've got a 43 years, 41 years, and then 53 years, probably helped by fire suppression. And if you go back before that, figure well, the, you know, the native people were being, um, you know, Malaya was fighting off the Wapo in the 1830s, so probably. Cultural burning was probably going on up until 1830, 1835. So you go back another 40, 45 years. So really a very kind of regular cycle, which, which is interesting. So you have a fire and what, what comes back? Well, um, 
If any of you have had a chance to go up into uh, chemise areas, you know, with the first rains, there's actually a chemical in the bark of chemise that once it's burned, um, it stimulates the seeds and the root ball underground to sprout. And so this is, you know, the following spring after a fire, chemise, um, you know, it can be very vigorous uh, coming back, even though it's, it's like a skeleton of dead, dead branches. Um, and here's uh, Bill Basilou, so he's one of the people I, when I mentioned local knowledge, uh, he's, he was born, I think, in 1917. He's, he's gone now, of course, but, um, but he remembered the 1964 fire. And this is how he described, you know, what happened after that fire, that things really recovered very quickly. And up, this is up on, um, uh, let's see, yeah, Glen Oaks Ranch, kind of up on the hillside above Glen Oaks. It had been a, like an upcoming pine forest. And after it burns, all these plants that I never would have expected uh, just showed up like you know, wild rose and all kinds of interesting plants in an area that you know, was more or less a conifer forest. So there's this whole cycle that goes on. You, you, know, you have a fire, you go clockwise, fire, you know, it sprouts, and then it gets overgrown, and then the fire comes back again, and the whole thing is about a you know, 40, 50 year cycle. Uh, it might be a little bit longer out on the coast, maybe she extended to like 60 years. But um, so this so this is a cycle that, that we see around here, um, you know, under whatever you want to call this mainstream culture that we're in right now, I guess. Um, so this this is what this is a result of our practices or lack of practices on the landscape. And of course, the fires that we get are can be catastrophic at the end of this cycle. Um, you know, the indigenous burning, cultural burning, uh, would burn much more often. Um, probably, you know, Clint wouldn't say, but what I can see is probably every, you know, five to 10, probably not more than 20 years in between a burn. So you're sort of taking a shortcut through the cycle, which means that you're not getting such catastrophic burning going on when you have, when you have a fire. And you're also choosing uh, the time uh, to burn. Like it's not just happening by accident, it's happening because you've, you're watching the, uh, watching the weather, you know, watching for conditions to be right so you can safely burn. And he told me um, that, you know, people burned um, chaparral and chemise because it, it's good uh, forage for the deer and good cover for the deer. So that was part of the reason they were burning the chaparral was to create uh, a healthy deer population, which you know, by extension would be a good Good for hunting. But it was a very, um, <laughs> when he described it, it as very, very fine scale burning. You know, everybody was burning the stuff that they were actually going to use or that they were like hunters were going to be burning the chaparral, basket makers were burning the sedge beds. You know, um, it, was, it was very fine scale. So, one of the interesting things that Clint told me that it was able to really make a bridge between like what he was telling me and the, the historical data, he said in the old days when we used to burn from the bottom of the hill up, it would burn up to the top of the hill, and the top of a ridge is kind of a natural fire break, and that's where most of the Douglas fir were, were up on the high on the ridges. They didn't, they didn't grow down lower because they would be burning up and the saplings would get, usually would get burned before they got very far. So I thought, well, let's see how that looks in the historical record, and sure enough, um, so you can see there's the range, the range of Douglas fir. This is on the, the east and the west side of the, of the area east of Glen Ellen. So here's on the west side, the Douglas fir have a fairly limited uh, elevation range. On the east side, it was bigger because it is cooler and moister over there. And then over time, uh, just kind of expanded out, you know, moved up and, up and down the mountain. You know, a little bit, also moved a little bit higher. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, but um, but mostly you know, it seems to have, seems to have moved downhill. Um, now this one looks kind of bizarre, but um, so back in the 1860s there were Douglas fir over at the, this is by Gurnville. There were Douglas fir there, but there were only maybe one percent of the landscape, very very small amount of Douglas fir. And then um, and then the logging happened, which mostly wiped out the redwoods. But then um, you know, in 19, post-1960, um, there just seems to have been a real surge of Douglas fir, which uh, has shown up in other places too. So there's, it seems to be rel 
relatively recent that it really just shut up. Uh, there's been changes, but it seems like it really something happened, uh, you know, mid to late 20th century. So here's a time lapse of Douglas Fir. Again, we're, we're east of Glen Ellen here. So we we'll start with the old surveys. And just like Clint said, most of the Douglas Fir are up high in the ridges. There's a few these are individual trees, and these are survey lines that were described as, as being Douglas Fir. Then you move ahead 60 years, and the Douglas Fir are expanding and moving down slope. Then another 60 years, and they really moved down slope a lot. And then 20 more years, uh, even more expanded. So one of the questions that when I see this, I start thinking of, so what is the Douglas Fir replacing? So let's let's so what are we going to do? One of the neat things about GIS you can do is you can you can sort of highlight all the Douglas fur on this map, and then you can take it to an earlier map and say clip, and it'll clip everything within these dark green polygons, and you'll see what is inside those polygons in the past. So, so here's the early surveys. Um, and of course, these were just lines and dots, these weren't on polygons and you can see a lot of it was chaparral uh, a little bit was hardwood 1932 still lots of chaparral uh and quite a bit of hardwood and a little bit of this coming in and then by 1993 yeah, it's mostly douglas fir but some hardwood and a little bit of chaparral and by 2013 it's all Douglas fir. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those are the kind of, and, and if you look on the ground when you're out in Douglas Fir Forest, you can sometimes see evidence of these changes. There's dead chaparral and dying oak trees. <laughs> All the tests of this on the ground. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, well, I think fire suppression, I mean, it certainly was a change in practices. So even if uh, people in the 1920s weren't actively burning, they were they were, um, they were doing things different or they were suppressing. Um, but I mean, you know, really suppression didn't um, didn't really take off until the 1940s. Oops, let's see. Like 1932, there really there really was not established fire departments. I mean, people would protect their own homes, but there wasn't a lot of active uh, fire suppression out. Again, like I said earlier, this is, this is in some ways this is like a natural experiment because there's not a whole, not a very big human footprint in this area. It's mostly uh, the vegetation doing what it does under the conditions that it's given. Um, I mean, certainly suppression has had an effect, but I think, but in 1932, I don't think active suppression was a big effect. And so, so well, why is this a problem? Well, um, you know, it all depends. I mean, I, I like Douglas fir, but, but there's certainly this sense, and I've even called them in the past native invasives because you can see them moving into lots of different areas. And uh, this is from um, someone at Agony Open Space, and I'll give you this slide. But they're concerned that this, the new preserve on Saddle Mountain about the Douglas fir encroachment uh, coming in. Um, and then also places during the glass fire that had uh, a lot of Douglas fir. I mean, you see this, look at this poor oak tree here. This oak tree was in the middle of all these young Douglas fir saplings and, um, you know, pretty much just toast because, you know, it got so hot in those areas. So, um, you know, Douglas fir, I think, when I was talking about balance before, I think this is part of the balance that uh, the indigenous people were, were working towards was, Keep things at a certain level, you know, in this case, the Douglas fir is kind of coming in, they've got their own agenda. It's another way to think about this. Like, you know, we didn't, I don't think we, I don't think any Douglas fir were planted up in the, uh, in the, uh, above Glen Ellen. That's just natural Douglas fir expansion. Um, and so they're kind of, well, we're doing our human thing down here, they're doing their tree thing up there. Uh, almost like a parallel world. Whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Okay. And are, overall, are we just losing the chef around? Um, well, that's a good question. So uh, up until about October 7th, 2017, I would have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, well, this was really interesting. So 
you know, when, when I first saw that map of the east of Glen Ellen that showed in 1932, showed all that chaparral, and I know that area, I mean, I drive by it every single day, and I go, how, how could that possibly be so much chaparral? These guys must have been lazy and they just didn't map it very well. Well, sure enough, after the 2017 fire, that's now mostly turned back into chaparral. And so it's starting this whole cycle again, I think, of you know, another given 30 or 40 years, and we will be, uh, if, we don't, if we don't change the way we're treating it, it'll probably end up being the same situation. Um, so, you know, one thing that we might want to think about because, well, let me, let me go ahead here a little bit. Uh, and this is interesting. This is this is over 100 years ago. This was the first native Californian to write uh, her autobiography. And this is up further north, so it's, it is a different environment. But she's talking about the same thing about the Douglas fir encroaching, and that they were burning. And even with burning, the Douglas fir was encroaching. Um, you know, they were losing um, up there. Maybe it was more prairie lands than chaparral, but they were they were losing um, you know prairie lands to uh, timber. Um, you know, this is this is like 50, 60 years after uh, white settlement up in that area. So um, yeah, this is going back to that early slide. Um, you know, we've seen how dynamic these changes can be. Um, you know, and the most fire prone places seem to be the places that where the vegetation changes the most rapidly. Um, you know, these frequent burn zones are where you get these cycles of you know, a few decades going from mostly shrub to mostly trees, just in maybe, you know, 30 years. Um, I didn't go into California Bay, but California Bay has also expanded. Uh, in those early surveys, um, you very rarely uh, find mention of bay trees. I mean, they're here, but they're just not, they're not much of a presence in the early surveys. And, um, you know, now we have tons of bay. And I'm not sure what that does for fire hazard, but I have a feeling it probably, if anything, it probably increases fire hazard. And if um, I can stop here, or if people are interested in uh, looking at catastrophic fire for a couple yeah. of uh, There's a question off of Zoom saying, why is Napa an exception? Uh, good question. That's what we're not getting into that. But, um, <laughs> so I, the, the basic answer is I don't know, but um, but the cycles in Napa seem to seem to be, if they're even happening at all, they seem to be going very slowly. So very, very slow vegetation change, um, possibly because uh, Napa burned in 1965, 1981, um, um, and 2017. So maybe maybe the fires have been coming more rapidly, and maybe that's preventing the establishment of woodland. That's my best guess. Or the geology and the soils are different. Um, or some combination of all those things. It's, um, Napa is a little bit drier than Sonoma, so it could be there's there's some um, some place in between the two where the, there's just not enough rainfall to sustain you know, more forest. But microclimates, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because on the on the east side of so there's the Sonoma Napa area, and on the east side of that you're looking at um, there's plenty of Douglas fir. And woodland in that area now, um, and you can go like five miles away into the Napa study area, and there's very few uh, trees, very few also Douglas fir. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of a conundrum, but I'm yeah I'm curious to look into it more. So this is just a question that I ask myself after looking at all this. Well, how how would the land look if it was well tended? You know, if, if you accept that premise that maybe the land hasn't been well tended, then you know, what are we what are we aiming for? Um, and I don't have you know I don't have a real answer other than maybe we need to think more about cycles and working with these cycles that are going on, um, and maybe being willing to accept um, you know I don't think there's a huge fan base for chaparral out there. I mean, <laughs> probably an exception is this group, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I think if people said, if we said, you know, let's let's turn the landscape back into 50% chaparral, I think there would be a lot of complaining. So, um, but I think it's a good thing is to try to get your head around a little bit. Like, what, what would it feel like to have a little different mix of forest and chaparral? And, and I'll give you some good reasons we might want to consider that. 
So before I get there, let's use my appreciation slide. Um, this is just a, a partial list, um, but uh, yeah, lots and lots of people and lots and lots of organizations, um, both for this project and uh, the projects over the years that have kind of built toward being able to do this kind of work because it's taken many years to just figure out how to how to work with all this data, and how to how to um, you know, compare apples to oranges and make them all apples. <laughs> So there's my contact info if anybody wants it. I'll have to give it to you after the show. So let me just go briefly into this uh, because to me, this is one of the most interesting parts is this, this addendum here because this was something that uh, sort of came up during the research. So thinking about a tipping point, um, well, one thing that I noticed was when you, when you plot the size of these fires over time, um, you have these fires that are Quite a bit bigger than anything else. Um, you know, why would those fires be so much bigger? How come we're not getting, um, you know, if, if this is climate change, how come we're not getting, you know, a fire up in this range here or here? You know, it's like all of a sudden it's, it's just popping up. And um, I won't show you all the other study areas, but but it's similar situation in the other study areas, except that one. <laughs> so I can't again, I can't explain that. <laughs> Um, but it, so there's all the, the information about tipping points, but it's just a small change that, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, you know, small change causes a, a massive uh, change in conditions that causes a massive change in outcome. So if you start thinking about the possible tipping points for fire, um, there's some, uh, some researchers have put out um, this idea of the 30-30-30 rule which is if you have uh, winds over 30 kilometers per hour, 18 miles per hour, um, temperatures over 30 degrees Celsius, and um, humidity below 30%, that those are the conditions in which you, can, which you get extreme fire behavior. So you, know, you can think of that as sort of a triple tipping point. But if you don't have all three of them together, it's not, a, not considered a tipping point. If you have low humidity and high temperature, but no wind, it, it doesn't cause extreme fire behavior. I mean, things will still burn, but it's not extreme fire behavior. Um, soil moisture, I haven't really looked into. Um, ignition is, is sort of a no-brainer. I mean, you have to have ignition, right, to, to have a fire. Um, and wind can cause ignitions, and wind does cause ignitions. Um, look at all the, the uh, fires that were named after PG&E. It's like, <laughs> it's like 30 of them in the county. PG&E fire number 27. <laughs> but, but we don't know the cause. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious. I can show you the maps to show this. Um, so the one one that I got interested in was you know you have to have fuel to have a fire, and, um, and so so why sixty percent? So if you look at the fire size and and so um, you know I, I'm calling I'm going to consider each of these a catastrophic fire, although the 1964 Nuns fire people remember it as catastrophic. But as far as, as the size of the fire goes, it wasn't particularly big. So I'm thinking of catastrophic as especially big fires, and the catastrophic kind of captures the human um, element of what they feel like if you're in the middle of one. Uh, no, this is just for size. Yeah. Um, so these are fires of unusual size rather than rodents of unusual size. If anybody's familiar with that belief, sorry. Couldn't resist. <laughs> okay, so um, so when I sort of brought up this idea that it, you know, it seems like when you get to a certain amount of uh, percentage of tree cover in the landscape, that's when, when these bigger fires happen. And several people uh, who I was working with said, well, what about, you know, it seems like wind, it seems like wind in 2017, that's what the tipping point was. That seems like the obvious tipping point. We all felt it. Um, you know, I was asleep, so I didn't notice it. <laughs> but I, I, I know it happened. I'm not, I'm not doubting it. I'm just, just um, so I thought, okay, let's look at um, so so um, sorry. So the way the way I tested this was to look at um, their, their the Modus satellite, uh, which was recording hotspots, right? And so and it also catches the time signature for each one. So you can look at when each of these hotspots happen. And were they happening when the winds were high? The winds actually fell off relatively quickly. I think by the morning, by noon on the, um, yeah, right here, 
So the wind went below that threshold of 18 miles an hour by noon on October 9th. So it was a fairly short window of high winds. So after that point in time, wind was not a tipping point. Uh, even if the humidity and the heat were still high, wind would not have served as a tipping point, at least according to the other research I've read. So um, and maybe you've already read all this, but the, the, the uh, Tubbs fire, I would say it was definitely was wind driven. You know, most of that burned during that. At wind phase, but the Nuns fire, uh, which came into my town in Glen Ellen and caused a lot of damage, um, you know, only a small portion of that was actually wind driven, and the rest of it was um, was fuel driven. Um, at least this is how I'm interpreting this. So, um, so you have woodland cover; it's increasing over time, right? You have a, a big fire. You know, the trees are coming back. Little by little over time, increasing in the amount of landscape they take up. And, but these catastrophic fires um, are suddenly, you know, at a certain point, um, they suddenly shoot up um, once you get past a certain amount of woodland cover. The size of the fires increases quite a bit. And this is, um, you know, this, is this is somebody else who wrote this the catastrophic fire um, goes up around 59%. Uh, I don't know if we can be quite that exact about it, but um, somewhere around 60%. And then here's here's uh, one of these is the same as the last graph, and then also in uh, Sonoma West, um, similar kind of a curve. As the woodland increases, uh, all of a sudden past about 60%, the size of the fire goes up dramatically. And so one of the tests of this was, you know, so why are we having these really big fires recently? And you know, I don't doubt that climate change has some part of this. I think there's possibly a lot of different factors playing in, but I do think that the percentage of woodland cover is, is worth considering. Um, so if you look at the uh, 1993 veg map and you take the perimeters of these recent fires and you say, what was the conditions like within those perimeters in 1993? And most of them were below 60%. So most of them were not primed to have a large fire. And by 2017, 2000, 2015 to 2020, they'd all moved into this more than 60% range. And suddenly we're getting these huge fires. So uh, here's a, and then there's, you can go online and this is kind of a fun thing to play with. So this is a percolation theory. This is a wildfire, a very simple wildfire model. So you can plug in, how dense do you want your forest? Okay, 55% of these cells have trees, and you hit go, and only 4% of this forest burns. Then you go up to, um, then you up it to 59%, and you get 36% burning. And these, this comes out a little differently every time, but, um, but this is the basic idea. You go up to 60, it suddenly goes from 36% to 77%. Mm -hmm. Just that 1%, it's a tipping point, right? It's suddenly boom, it's much bigger. And then um, and then here's, if you go to 69%, which is more or less conditions during the Thames fire, um, you get a fire that wipes out almost everything. You know, it burns the whole area. Um, or the, or I should say the Thames fire, the Nuns fire, which is a fuel driven fire, um, covers a very large area. So, yeah, like I said, it's all seemed to hold except for Napa. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, what this says to me, I, mean, I think certainly this needs more study, but it suggests to me that if, you know, if there's just a small change in the, in the woodland cover to make that big of a difference in how big a fire gets, then the amount of, um, you know, uh, fuel reduction um, might be relatively small. Or the other thing I think of is like we just had these really big fires, you know, these areas just burned. If we can just keep those areas, you know, with less by doing prescriptive burning or even cultural burning, if we can keep the woodland covered below that threshold, then they're unlikely to have these huge catastrophic fires again. They're still going to burn, um, you know, one way or the other, but they're not going to be these catastrophic fires. That's my that's my uh, optimistic take on all this. Uh, <laughs> <thanks>. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I think, well, we'll find out. But if, um, I mean, this just finished up a couple weeks ago. So, um, but when I gave this webinar back in March, uh, the, one of the Cal Fire people was there. Um, I just had a really good conversation with Ben Nichols, who's Cal Fire. Uh, he's out in the West County. Um, so he's really interested in this. He, and I showed him what the stuff that he's, you know, he thinks it's, you know, um, thinks it's very plausible, what's, what this is suggesting. So. Yeah, yeah. We're still we're still waiting to kind of hear back from Tom Player and they might ask us to make some adjustments in it, but um yeah, it'll it'll be up. Can we ask you to use the mic, please? Or you gotta I'll give her the mic. Oh okay, yeah. Sorry. Right, take the, the mic to her, Karen. <laughs> well you would hope so, but there's a lot of money to be made out there. Oops. Like just on a, on a just a quick note on that, on a personal note, we, we lost our home in 2017 in Glen Allen, and I read about how the in Coffee Park, the wooden fences are what, one of the things that carry the fire throughout that. And so I don't want to have a wooden fence near my house. So we started talking to fencing companies and we wanted you know, creative ideas for how can we put something up that's not a it's not a wall, but it's gonna slow down a fire. None of them would do it. They wouldn't you know, never they wouldn't come up with any ideas, they wouldn't brainstorm with us. So we ended up putting up a Stuff called a cortan, which it looks like a sheet metal roofing, but it rusts. It looks nice. And so we put it's half wood and half cortan. So if it, if it starts on fire, it's only going to burn a little ways, but it'll stop. And then maybe you know, it'll be a, it's not going to be just a, a wick going down to the next house. Yeah. Um, do you have data or were you, were you able to look at all, or is there any record, I guess, of? Ancient data, what you know, before there was cultural burning, was can you see if there was you know 50 year cycles of fire? I guess that, that would be, I, I don't know, archaeology. Or something. Um, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, you know, I mean, it could be if you took like samples in Clear Lake, you can find stuff like that. I mean, and actually, I know they have looked at vegetation records, like pollen records from Clear Lake. Um, which I know it demonstrates the shifts between conifers into bosoms, I think, after the Ice Age, stuff like that. Um, I mean, I think, well, my own personal feeling is, is that people have been here so long now that, that really cultural burning really is part of the landscape. You know, it's, it's part of the cultural landscape. And we live in a different cultural landscape, but I think there's a lot we can learn from, from that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering the Paradise Fire. Uh, any information from somebody studying it there, or how would it compare to what your data was showing, or more like Napa? Or I would imagine it'd be similar to what your data is showing for here. But any comparison with the Paradise um, Sierra yeah, Foothills? I haven't had a chance to compare it up there. It'd be really interesting to, to see what that what that shows. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jerry. What the, Wait a minute. What is all this? Uh, uh, how, how is it all affecting the redwoods? Um, good question. I, I don't think a whole lot. I didn't, I didn't notice a whole lot of change in, in redwood. I could, um, you know, there's 100 pages of, uh, of tables in this, which, which uh, we can take a look at after, I, after my talk. If you want to look at it, we can take a look, look at that specific question that I haven't really looked at. Uh -huh. The bird, um, and I haven't seen that. I mean, I've heard some things like certain birds come into recently bird forests. You know, it's good for certain species. I don't, I don't know too much about it, but I, I've heard that. I think Matt Clark was doing some some bird studies uh, up in the glass fire area to see what was coming back after the burn. Um, I don't know any details beyond that. Uh -huh. Is anybody um, doing research on lichens, lichen groves after the fires? Uh, good question. <laughs> Haven't heard, but I'll, I'll let you know as soon as I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when we were in Pinnacle National Park recently, 
we were there with about about nineteen. He was talking about the ladder fuel so on the huge, huge valley of their big, big oak, mm -hmm. and um, they had these pines that were coming up. You know, ladder fuel just like these. What kind of pines? Gray. Yeah, the gray pines coming up all up around these just huge oak trees, and just the same thing he was saying. There was a fire coming on. Those oak would be toast because you know the the pines would serve as ladder fuel. Well, can you imagine a national park if they start cutting those down? But people would do. Yeah. So it's like we're so far away <laughs> from thinking the right way because they should take those down. You know, but we logged <laughs> we logged pine at Hawks Hill in Golden Gate National Parks. It just so I you know like yeah. what you're doing is really important. <laughs> I mean I, I think um, I mean you make a really good point and I think you know it's it's definitely a, a big lift for the public for some of these things, but I think well I'll tell you one little story uh, uh, out at Heron Shadow, which they're they're managing it um, both you know, using indigenous techniques and also you know more sort of mainstream techniques like they have an orchard and things like that. But they had a cultural burn at, at Heron Shadow, and there, it's only a seven acre parcel. And so they went in very slowly, and they they talked to all their neighbors, and they, they told them what was going on, and they got all the right permits. And um, and then on the day they were going to burn, and they invited all the neighbors to come watch. And so. Um, you know, it sounds scary, but actually, you know, the, the way they described it actually was, was a fun event because, like, they were giving kids little, you know, pine cones that were lit on fire and they could chuck them in the grass. That was a boy's dream, right? <laughs> so, um, so I think it's going to happen. Fire, it's going to be very slowly as people have to experience it. And when I mentioned indigenous wisdom, it includes more than just ecology. Like, that's that's acknowledging that teenage boys in particular like to play with fire <laughs> and finding an outlet that you know that is constructive. You know, so so it's like it's, it's serving you know everybody. Um, so that's why I like indigenous wisdom. You know, it, it We've got uh, our next question uh, um, on Zoom. It's but if the climate were cooler, more humid, you could have 100% woods and no catastrophic fires. So isn't this largely a function of climate change? Well, I, I won't pretend to have a definitive answer to that, but I guess, you know, what I'm seeing is, is that I'm not, at least right here, I didn't see tipping point, um, you know, from, from temperature, from just temperature and humidity, which are two things that climate change changes. And if you have the wind in, then you've got a tipping point. So um, uh, let's see. I mean, I think. Well, if you look at the percolation model. You could have a, if you didn't fight it, you could have a fire that would that would just uh, you know, burn through a, a whole area. Um, so that's, I know that sounds, that sounds good. It's a little wishy washy, but yeah, yeah. best I can do. Uh, we've got yeah. another question. Um, I think of Chaparral as fire prone or even more than woodlands and forest. Southern California has equally large and devastating fires purely in Chaparral, so not sure the transition. To woodlands and forest equals higher intensity fires. Um, yeah, you know this comes up, uh, and I. Well, one thing is, you know, Southern California is a different place than Sonoma County, so I don't think you know people tend to equate them, but I just think just because they're both chaparral, I don't think they're equivalent. And I know there's a lot of concern that in Southern California you see type conversion from chaparral to grassland, and I have not seen that yet. In the in the record, you know, there's there's not a lot of grassland up here, and it doesn't seem to fluctuate very much up and down. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, chaparral can burn pretty hot, but it's also as far as the amount of biomass, I, it, you know, compared to a tree, it's not that much. So, I think um, the overall scheme of things, it's not as it's not as devastating of a fire. Uh, yeah, one more question on here, and then we'll switch back to okay, Anderson. yeah. Um, I'd like to think that the threshold level tipping point would be sensitive to plant dryness and moisture stress during periods of drought, a uh, high level of forest cover that is not a tipping point before might well be more susceptible. Uh, I got the question right. Um, well, so, you know, one thing I, uh, I'll 
probably something a little bit here. I think one thing is we, you know, we're all thinking climate change. So we assume that climate change is the thing that's causing these fires. And it, it may well have a, a big role. I'm not going to doubt that. But at the same time, you know, <clears throat> climate's changing over time, but the woodland is also increasing over time. So if something else is increasing, so so um, I think it's possible that it's the change in woodland that's the tipping point as opposed to the change in you know, the, the climate change um, element, or at least at least it's a, I mean it's complicated, I'm sure, but but um but there's an interesting paper by um I can show you the exact citation, but somebody named Beverly uh, up in Canada who looked at like hundred million acres and looked at what burned in that 100 million acres and what didn't burn over a number of years. And she came up with the same 60% number. Is it, um, as I understand it, they had like a kind of a grid. And if, if you were in a place that had like, you know, it was only rating it by things that were burnable. It wasn't looking at anything else. It was looking at temperature or anything else. But if, it was, if you were surrounded by 60% of burnable stuff, then the chances of burning were were way higher, and if it wasn't, if you didn't have that, then um, you probably wouldn't burn. And it was, I'm not saying it very, uh, very articulately, but um, so it seemed like somebody else had sort of come to this uh, at least tentative conclusion that maybe it's the amount of woodland that's actually driving some of these, the size of these fires. I, I, when this one last whole thing is, I, I won't say that the, you know, that the chance of a fire, of any fire at high humidity and high temperature, I'm sure is greater. But the chance we're talking about big catastrophic fires. We're not talking about any fire, we're just talking about a big fire. What's the tipping point for a big catastrophic fire? Uh -huh. I, I just wanted to make a quick comment to what was said earlier about would the public accept uh, more open uh, view vistas rather than woodlands? And I was wondering if anybody else had an impression of what happened in Yellowstone after the, the fire there, the before and the after. Uh, I, I think. Many of the public enjoyed the more open vistas in Yellowstone after their fire. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's necessarily we have to assume that the public would be horrified by <laughs> uh, um, measured burn policies. Uh, people might really appreciate it and prefer just a comment. Yeah, I think if they understand it, it might make them safer. Yes. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there some theory or explanation about why the conifers are regenerating like and extending like this instead of the chaparral regenerating? Uh, I haven't, I have, you know, I, I mean, I have actually haven't, I've done a lot of, a lot of literature search and I have not found, I mean, somebody must have looked into this, but I haven't found any studies that, that look at this cycle and look at the chaparral turning, turning into women, you know. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Uh, yeah. So, she, so she was saying that people don't really like chaparral, and so they cut it down and they build a house. <laughs> and plant trees, is that right? Yeah. So maybe chaparral is at a disadvantage. Overall yeah. speed. I think it needs a good PR plan. <laughs> <laughs> the chaparral typically needs a um, quicker return cycle than fires. Mm -hmm. Chaparral, to some degree, can require fires, regenerate, and that's quicker than people want to build a house again. Uh, yes, it's <laughs> shorter than a lifetime, then maybe it's, yeah, people don't like it. Uh -huh. Yeah, my, I'm sorry, I, I just got to hear you. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I was just going to say with the chaparral too, I, is, is that related to succession in, in, in the landscape? But that wasn't actually my question. Um, my question was, I'm just thinking about how you described when steel, you know, when things needed to happen, and then you kind of, and other people come to this 60% number. Um, and I just think it's interesting that maybe you feel like Maybe now that you've gone through that process, you've got that feel for the 60% that maybe is similar or something. I don't know if you just had related that at all between the two. I, I hadn't really thought about that. I mean, uh, um, 
there's they're a little different because the 60 percent is woodland and and Clint was talking about looking at chaparral and what chaparral wanted to burn but i would you know but, but i think that's that feeling what I mean, what does a 60 percent landscape feel like as opposed to a 75 percent landscape but i think that probably would be a good thing to call it. <laughs> so what i was going to say about chaparral and doug fur is my understanding is that one of the reasons that the Native people did burn in our region so frequently was to keep the dug of fur at bay mm -hmm. and keep, because the chaparral would keep, keep you know, it would stay there. And the oaks, the other things, you know, again, low intensity fires, frequent, moderately frequent burns. Whereas in Southern California, you don't have that pressure from the dug of fur and frequent burning of chaparral is actually harmful. Mm -hmm. It should burn on a much longer cycle. It's from my, my understanding from the Chaparral Institute and what I experienced going through the Bel Air fire in the middle of Santa Monica Mountains when I was a kid is that it was a very mature Chaparral and it rebounded pretty amazingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. What would you have a problem is the uh, expansion of blooms that come from places like we might be in room very hot, and uh, there were a large fire one a few years ago in the coastal fire. Uh, they burned and burned it, they couldn't put out at all, they just had to let it go. Well, in the areas I looked at, there was uh, that was never there was no mapping that showed room, you know, there were no so you know, I'm not saying it wasn't there, but it wasn't big enough. You know, if it was under an acre, probably it wouldn't have shown up in any of the maps that I used. Um, so I tend to think as far as as far as an exotic plant, it's a problem, but as far as fire danger in general, I mean, there's some room up the hill for me. I should probably think about this. <laughs> but uh, uh, on a big scale, I don't think it's a big well, specific issue. Yeah, I was thinking about the Bodega fire, Bodega Bay fire. It uh, went and went, and they, they couldn't deal with it. Yeah. And just how Expansive is that problem? Is it growing? Uh, I, I didn't really look at that. Uh, you know, I, I had to kind of limit myself to just the areas that I was, just the study areas and whatever the data. You know, I was I was really kind of piggybacking on a whole bunch of other people that had created these maps and these surveys. Um, so you know, um, and there probably isn't just sort of data for rooms along the coast because they weren't there. Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a good, I mean, that's, you know, some of these exotic plants are eucalyptus, you know, those, those do show up on some of these maps, you know, small areas, you can see eucalyptus. I think we have a couple more Zoom questions. All right, there's there's a few more. I could state them all, or I could do one at a time, whichever you'd prefer. Uh, whatever you think would work. Yeah. Okay. This okay. next one is a really, really wonderful, well, they're all wonderful. Um, how do we support more historical uh, ecological work um, and how can we all better incorporate historical ecological methods into our conservation and restoration work? Um, that's a good question. You know, there's a few of us around. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, which could you show that now that we have the yeah. lights on and a good view while you're in front of the camera? <clears throat> so this is um I mean this is well, it's, it's definitely has historical ecology in it, but it's also a lot of other other things uh, about Sonoma Mountain. Um, so you know I was I mean I've always been interested in history. I've always been interested in ecology. Um, and I was lucky enough to get hired by the Snow Ecology Center back in 2000 to do oral histories, looking at, looking at fish populations in Snow Creek, and then that just kind of grew into what I'm doing now. Um, and now I'm an independent consultant, but so the Ecology Center at least had a historical ecologist for 10 years when I was there, but I don't think they have anybody there now. Um, but, um, but you know, you could, if you pester them, they could probably dig up some of my old stuff, or I could, or you can contact me. If you have specific questions, I'd be happy to, um, you know, just contact me at baseline at um, and I'd be happy to answer your questions and maybe point you to, to uh, um, 
I can help you out if I can. Uh, Repeat the question, please. Um, um, there's a lot of translations in the early journals. So. Really journals. Yeah. Like the, and there's things you can buy in publications. The journey of Pedro Paez, who's one of the first explorers in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, these translations contain descriptions of burning and the Bay Area being very smoky mm -hmm. at different times because of the burning marshes, the burning woodlands. It's just it's fascinating stuff. But it's out there and I'm sure you've used it. I, I haven't actually used. looked at that source, I'd be interested to see. Yeah, well there's that book I told you about the first uh, the California's fading wildfires. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that has some good translations. Yes. And it's amazing that you can it's been it's been fun to to you know to watch the transitions around going on you know what, what's come back after the fire yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> I think they meant to hire you one of these days <laughs> is there another question from Zoom <laughs> could you name a couple hardwoods that are the most resistant to fire. Um, yeah, coast live oak seems to do pretty well. Coast live oak. Okay. Um, I don't think what else. Um, I think. Yeah, I'm tempted to say the drone, but I'm not really sure. Um, I'm kind of curious because uh, I've always wanted to do some vegetation mapping on my little ranch, and I, I have a variety of oak trees, and I'm uh, just kind of curious. Uh, but I do have several scrub oak and you know valley oak, black oak, you know. Um, so okay, thank you. And I think um, yeah, the best thing to do would be probably to think about like ladder tools and what's keep them safe from, from fire, or figure out what's a good configuration so that you don't have a lot of fuel close together. Um, on our property, we've lost a number of oak trees. But one value can survive in the backyard. It's got a big bird scar going up it, but it's it's doing okay. Yeah, it's putting out leaves every year. Uh, I think maybe we try it because of the fire, because all those nutrients are going back up as well. Give my feet out. Any other uh, zinc questions? Nope. Uh, thank you.